Okay. We did. Oh, everything up to now. Before this, it was Darcy's law and talking about hydraulic conductivity as well, which is something we'll come back to actually quite a lot because it's a really important uh, part of hydro. Um, more flow properties of aquifers. That's what it is, storage properties. That were good slides and we'll storage and specific yield and uh, whatever. Darcy's law will get on to permeabilities and things in a minute uh, as well. But you know, anisotropy and heterogeneity of aquifer material, geological layers in general, is anyway, is a, it's really important because it adds a huge complication to uh, studying the things because nothing is isotropic and nothing is homogeneous, unfortunately. If it was, it makes the world a lot easier, but because it's not, you can make a lot of assumptions when you're coming up with equations to apply to groundwater flow with a bugger. <coughs> There's four different scenarios you can have when it comes to dealing with these two qualities in an aquifer. And it's all about measuring hydraulic conductivity K in the aquifer at particular point. So if you, can, if you can have an aquifer or a layer, you can measure hydraulic conductivity at one point. And it doesn't matter whether you measure it vertically or horizontally or an angle, it's the same. And then you can go to another point and do the same thing, okay? Then that is a nice isotropic aquifer. The hydraulic conductivity is the same in any direction. Never happens. It's, it's virtually impossible, unfortunately. If the hydraulic conductivity varies with direction at, a, at any point in the aquifer, so the vertical conductivity, for instance, is much less than the horizontal, right, then your aquifer is anisotropic. That's normal. The vertical conductivity is usually a lot less, not always, but usually a lot less than horizontal. So the vertical speed of the water is much less than the horizontal speed of the water. This stuff becomes really important when you're modeling, and then you have to actually come up with some supposedly realistic representation of the system that you're dealing with. Again, that's uh, almost the possibility as well. If you can measure K at <coughs> two different points and the vertical conductivities and the horizontal con conductivities are different, but they're the same at each point, okay, then your aquifer is homogeneous. And if all the parameters are different at any point, then you have a... I like the camera. <laughs> No, it's called cool electric fears, isn't it? <laughs> I know the SLT is one as well, the lights just randomly come on and off during the thing. Maybe it's just not even a spotlight. Then it's a heterogeneous aquifer, and that's probably more realistic for these things um, as well. But for when you're dealing with these, a lot of these are simplified down to make it workable. If you need to deal with nature, to try and quantify nature exactly, it's just impossible you can't do it. Certainly not for our maths anyway. All aquifers, I've said, are essentially heterogeneous. Okay, so you assume an average conductivity overall once you've worked out the, 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 the two various directions if you can anyway, to establish what you're going to use in your calculations when it comes to reducing all the data from your pub tests and what you're going to use in your modelling if you get that far as well. High degrees of either or make it very difficult to quantify and simulate the ecosystem. And unfortunately, in many cases, that is reality, it's just the way it works. Okay, so we'll never get the thing to put you down pat, you'll just get a very, hopefully, a close simulation, and that will have to do with, you know, so this is very important when it comes to dealing with the, the groundwater modeling. Causes of these things, of course, sedimentation, okay, grain size, stratification, uh, sphericity of, uh, of, of grains, the packing of grains, the rock type itself, okay, you're going to have inherently different um, properties vertically and horizontally or indeed all the way through the rock mass. Air stratification, bedding, different lenses, and also structures, faults and things can get in the way as well and change these values in or through an aquifer. Okay? So having as much information as possible about what you're dealing with is really, really useful because the more information you have, the better refined you can make your guesses. Okay? I call them guesses, but they essentially are to some degree when you're intuitive uh, um, guesses anyway. So it's very really important when you're dealing with aquifers and working with these things to, to have a really good idea of what they're made of, what the structure of them is, etc. Which is why you guys as geologists have a big head start on a lot of people, because even though some of this stuff is very simple, layering and bedding and sedimentation and things, for most people out there it's not. They've never heard of it, they've never studied it, they don't know anything about it. Right? So that's why teaching this stuff to you guys is great, so I don't have to do any geology if you really want. And it's quite a big thing. Okay? Engineers don't know this stuff in general. Okay? They, they, do the equations, no worries at all, drive from first principles probably, but their application on them will be wrong because they don't have the knowledge of the structure, the layer, whatever else is happening in these natural systems to, uh, to back it up with. 
So here's diagrams of these of what those things I talked about before the points. Dum 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 dum. Okay. Dum 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 dum. Okay. There you go. X is horizontal, vertical. That's horizontal, horizontal. Um, conductivity and Z is vertical. It's the standard way of doing these things. That way about Y that comes in the other board. We'll never deal with Y. So if K is the same vertically and horizontally or in any direction, any point of the aquifer, okay, that's where you get your homogeneous isotropic aquifer. You're a totally unrealistic system. This doesn't work. Well, you don't get it. If it's the same vertically and horizontally, even though those two are different at any point, but if they're the same at other points, okay, you've got a homogeneous and isotropic aquifer. Much more common, okay, much more realistic in the scheme of things. <coughs> K is the same vertically and horizontally, but those values are different at any point. Heterogeneous isotropic aquifer, okay, not that realistic. And if they're different vertically and horizontally at any point all over the whole aquifer, then you've got your heterogeneous and isotropic aquifer. Probably more real life, but you can simplify things for a million times to this kind of thing. And sometimes even to this, if you're really good, lucky. But you've just got to be aware of what you're dealing with. Okay? You're dealing with complications. Any answer you come up with is always going to be an oversimplification. You can only do the best with what you've got. The more you've got, the better you can do. Just be aware of that. So causes of heterogeneity, as I said before, layering. Each of these layers will have different values. Okay? But within each layer, the values will probably be the same. It's all good. Lateral trends going from fine material through a mixture of coarse and fine coarse <coughs> material. Each of these have different properties. Okay? So you keep mixing through here as well. And boundaries, faults, where the properties can completely change from one side of the fault to the other. Faults make, they can make really good um, pathways or conduits for water, but they can also make extremely good barriers to water as well. It's something to really be aware of if you're dealing with groundwater over large areas. We suspect that you're going to be doing pumping or something near a fault. You better be aware of it because you can stuff your thing year round. Your results are pretty badly. And of course, ways of varying. Isotropy, if everything's nice and neatly packed, okay, and same size, evenly spaced, everything, you're going to have K will be the same no matter, no matter which direction you measure it in. Of course, you hardly ever get that because during lithification you get compaction, settling, or it gets grains, all sorts of things like that as well. And so you'll develop isotropy and isotropy, so it'll be K's, or K's will be bigger in the horizontal direction than in the vertical direction. So that's causes of those as well. Of course, often an aquifer will be very complicated, especially thick ones. And it'll consist of lots of layers, essentially homogeneous layers, but all with different values. Okay, you can get around that by working out yeah. an average. It's very easy to do. So you can, you can basically work out overall average kx and kz, and use that for your system. You're, near, you're very rarely trying to model and do these things very, very small systems. Okay, it's, you just can't isolate things. You're trying to get as much water as possible. So usually over a large area, if you have got variability through that, then you just need to simplify it down a bit and you can take averages. So you can average it out, just using that symbol from there. Okay, and using these parameters is not hard to do. It looks complicated, it's not at all complicated, it's an no panic. And same with Z. Okay, and of course these values will be controlled by the, the lowest value throughout the aquifer. But either way you could get if you if you'd screened that whole thing and you wanted to pump from it and you wanted to work out your KZs and your KXs for your modeling, so to do, to do your predictive modeling, then you can very easily reduce that complexity to quite simple numbers, and you simply just model the whole aquifer as one um, as one layer. <coughs> Fracture block is a complete prick to work with. It's, a, it's absolutely nasty. Um, unfortunately, it's where all the good water comes from in New Zealand. Lots of it. You have to deal with it. It's exceedingly complicated. No one has really worked out how to deal with it yet. The formulae to go with it are really hard and nasty. People are always changing their minds, and it's, it's very hard to quantify. It can be done, and, 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 and you, know, you can do it with a reasonable amount of water. Um, of um, not, not accuracy, I guess, but uh, certainty, I suppose, uh, for a lot of information. But it's just a real pain in the ass to deal with because you're not dealing with nice green material with water's flowing evenly all over the place, okay, in all directions, okay. You've got very discrete fractures separated from each other, okay, um, various degrees of interconnection, and all sorts of other nastiness that goes along with it. So sometimes it's very hard to work with. Depends on the density of fractures. If the rock's really fractured, you can essentially, if it's a large aquifer, Treat it like a uh, like a um, like porous granular one, and use Darcy's law. But uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's just not the case. Uh, if, if it is, then if you've got irregular 
spacing in a given direction. You can have heterogeneity, you can quantify the heterogeneous if you've got different spacing in one and the other, you can quantify it in isotropic. The same as we did with those diagrams before. But you've really got to sit back and, and think when you're dealing with fractured rock aquifers, they're really hard work. So unfortunately, or well fortunately, they, they hold tons of water, they're really good if you get decent ones. Um, for various reasons, which I'll talk about in future lectures, but um, yeah, they, they don't conform to any of the normal nice things that you uh, get used to dealing with when you do things in lectures and labs, unfortunately. <coughs> uh, if the density is lower, if the fracture density is lower, like here you've got sort of lots of spacing between fractures, and fractures don't make the body of the rock, there's lots more rock than fracture, then um, you can get info, you, know, you, can, you can gain estimates of, of this. If you can um, get an idea of things like fracture spacing and uh, um, aperture and, and connectedness and, and also um, different um, sets of, of, of fractures as well, when you're dealing with a planar system or a cubic system or something like that. Um, and you can do something with that as well, but as like I say, it just, it just makes things so much harder. It'd be really good if you could ignore it, ignore it, it just goes away, but unfortunately it doesn't because they do behave very differently to, uh, to normal granules sort of porous aquifers. Uh, you get these things here from field observations, if you're lucky, you can see equal material, similar material too exposed to the surface, you actually go up and you can measure spacings and you can measure apertures and you can work out consistencies and check if things are open or wide or whatever. Hopefully you can do that, if not, hopefully you've got access to drill core because that's your second best thing, if you haven't got either of those and you're just making guesses and um, mm, good luck with that. <coughs> And here's a couple of different ways of doing it. Again, don't worry too much about this. This is all this is fluid properties, density, and viscosity of water, and this is all to do with the fracture spacing or whatever. But you see, if you've just got, say, planar series, parallel series of fractures, just in one, one dimension, okay, you can use this to try and calculate what K is, you know, maybe a reasonable value of it, maybe not. It just depends what, um, what information you've got. You can see that if you've got a Cubic array, so you have more fractures, so not fractures just in one plane, but fractures in two or three planes, and connected, okay, obviously you're making things a lot better for yourself, the aquifers being much nicer to you, and you greatly increase your value of K. You see here you're divided by 12, here you're only dividing by 6, so you get larger numbers. But overall, the actual real equations for dealing with fractures and flow through, flow through fractures in aquifers and later on I'll talk about different methods for working out things from some tests of that. It's, uh, you can do really hard work, so hopefully if you have to deal with aquifers, they might not be nice granular ones. Okay, permeability. In terms of permeability, the connectedness of, 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 of um, pore space within your aquifer, okay, how the water moves through the formation, how the fluid moves through the formation. It's great stuff. This is a matrix property only, okay? so any particular media, you know, particular sandstone or particular whatever, has its own value of intrinsic permeability. You can change the fluid properties and the intrinsic permeability won't change. Okay? If you change the matrix properties, it will change. Unlike the hydraulic conductivity, if you change either property, the K changes. If you change the properties of the aquifer or the fluid, it doesn't matter, K changes here, it's only the matrix. It's only the, uh, the media that uh, is important. So it's only a function of pore openings. So large openings, of course, larger permeabilities, smaller openings, smaller permeabilities as you'd expect. Uh, the faster flow, the slower flow. But don't confuse it with K, they're very different beasts. <coughs> it's really useful well, for hydrogeologists, but also these guys here when you're dealing with changing fluid properties, because what you do is you establish your um, intrinsic permeability for your media in states that just stay set. And then you can model putting all sorts of things through it. You put gas through it, you put water through it at different temperatures, you can put oil through it or a mixture. I like to see how your K changes, your hydraulic conductivity changes. So once you've established your little K permeability, it's a really useful thing, uh, a useful thing to do. So people have experimented in the past with all sorts of different media. They've, they've modeled the media using various sizes, glass beads and various mixtures of sizes, different packings and all sorts of that, and different fluids passing through it. And like Darcy did with the sand and his water through his tubes, they came up with a whole lot of empiric relationships between Q and other things, okay? Q in this case, and gamma, it's just the weight of the fluid. It's the density times acceleration due to gravity, and it's directly proportional to that, so that's all good inversely proportional to the viscosity of the liquid. It's 
proportional to the square of the diameter of the particles that make up the aquifer or the, the, the media and proportional to this constant. You always have to reduce constant in these things in case you've noticed. Representing the shapes of particles and the packing of things. Okay, so they've, they've quantified that to some degree as well. So all of these things here, we had a list of those sort of Darcy's law, we had, we had K, we had um, you know, DHDL, we had L, and we had I, or what became I. You can replace all those things in Darcy's law with these things and come up with a rewriting of Darcy's law. Okay? For the properties, media properties, that'll become important in the That looks like that. Darcy's law looks much simpler because you have all this guff in it, but it's exactly the same thing. Okay? Q equals KIA. Okay? So K is replaced in this thing by these things here. Okay? And this, this becomes important uh, in a minute. So we've rewritten Darcy's law to have something different, but it's still essentially Darcy's law, just using some different variables in it. Now you can combine the media properties. These two here, C and D squared, okay? Combine those. They are the intrinsic permeabilities. Remember, the intrinsic permeability is the properties of the media only, and the properties of the media only are the diameter and the constant representing those things. So those there become the intrinsic permeability. So you can simplify your formula already by replacing this thing with just that K. It also happens that Q over A, okay, from Darcy's law, Okay, is a value called Darcy and velocity, or specific discharge, actually is probably what it should be called. If you change that, it should be specific discharge. And so that the Q over A becomes what here is Darcy's velocity, or Darcy and velocity. So we can start to simplify our equations again. So this thing now can be reduced to that, okay? Because the CD becomes K. So there's your permeability, and you can put these. Here's your gradient, and we've divided that by that to get our Darcyian velocity. So we've reduced our equation down somewhat. Darcy's law can also be rewritten, the original one, okay? Divide Q by A, okay, to get our Darcyian velocity. So to become K times the hydraulic gradient, okay? So Ki essentially, D over the place DHDL I. You can see though, if BD equals this here, and D equals this here, that means this must equal this. So these two things can be combined okay, to come up with that. We've reduced our equation down to something nice and simple. I mean, that's hydraulic conductivity. So we can actually work out hydraulic conductivity if we can work out our aquifer properties and we know our fluid properties, we can get a good estimation of hydraulic conductivity. You can also see is this here is aquifer properties and this here is fluid properties. If you change either of these, this changes, okay? And that's what those people that do modeling in the oil industry and all sorts of things do. They establish this, they change these to get this, because you can rewrite the equation to put this out the front as well. <coughs> I delete it because it was getting a bit complex and nasty. All good? So far? So it's pretty simple stuff. It's not, there's no differentiation and nastiness in this. It's all, just, it's all pretty simple. So K is constant for any particular medium, all right? So, so you plug that in, change these to different values of hydraulic conductivity, which of course there, that's really useful because then you can work out how many wells or whatever you're doing in the ground is going to react to pumping at certain velocities, okay, certain discharge rates, all sorts of what's going to happen theoretically to the piezometric surface or the groundwater table or your reservoir or whatever, it's all good. And this one, conversely of course, is constant in any particular media and fluid combination. Okay, so this will change no matter what you change in here, this one here. Like it's going to be constant. Right. Yeah, okay. So with your permeability anyway, go back to the beginning, the simple stuff. You increase it as you get larger grain sizes. I showed at the very beginning the porosity, you get bigger pore space. If those are all connected, of course, as larger well mixed and well sorted grains, you get better permeability as well. Poorly sorted sediments, less uh, porosity, generally less permeability. Okay. <coughs> right. Transmissivity. Another really important. Um, um, value, this is another one that's used extensively in modelling. You need, like I said at the beginning, you need hydraulic conductivity, transmissivity, porosity, and storativity. Right? Those are the four values you need to plug into groundwater models and equations to get a really good idea of what's going on and what your aquifer is doing, whether it's a confined aquifer, a leaky aquifer, whether it's unconfined, or whatever. And this is the last of those values that, uh, that you have. To get, it's very similar to hydraulic conductivity, except in this case, rather than just for a unit, 
area, you're actually dealing with flow through the whole thickness of the aquifer. So it's simply multiplying hydraulic conductivity by the aquifer. Thickness, it's really important. Used to calculate well yields, to make safe yields of, of aquifers, like safe pumping rates, so you're not drawing down too much. You're not going to draw your well out, you're not going to damage your aquifer. So it's a really, really important, um, important value. And again, it's like K, okay, it's a measure of how easily a fluid passes through a particular media. So T, any particular media will have a specific T, but it will be dependent on the thickness of that media. Okay? Because it's simply conductivity multiplied by the saturated aquifer thickness. In confined aquifers, it doesn't change. Because confined aquifers are always saturated, so you get your saturated thickness is constant. In unconfined aquifers, because things get really complicated because as you drain the aquifer, as you pump the aquifer, the water level drops, and if the water level drops, the saturated thickness drops. And so through time, dealing with confined aquifers and the equations, the un unconfined aquifers and flow equations becomes very tricky because you've got to keep changing this value. And again, people have got around that in various tricky ways. So there's K, I defined it previously, okay? It's the rate of flow through a unit area of material under a hydraulic gradient of one, so a drop in one meter vertical, one meter horizontal, so essentially water flowing downwards at 45 degrees, which never happens. Okay, and it will flow through this area at a certain rate. Well, T is exactly the same, you've got the same gradient, the same unit width, but you just multiply that by the whole thickness of the aquifer, so the whole aquifer comes in play. So again, so like I say, really important and, uh, <coughs> and useful value for groundwater studies. Okay, hydraulic head. So there's another important thing to notice is something you generally learn by drilling holes in the ground and putting things that are measuring how deep the water level is below the ground and um, converting that to a RL to a relative level above sea, above sea level and whatever data you decide to uh, to uh, choose. But anyway, it's the height above the datum, and generally you use mean sea level, okay, if you can, because you know, if you establish a base level, then you know where sea level is all the time, all the topo maps and surveying and things that you do are relative to sea level, so you might as well use that. Height above that, of the column of water that can be supported by the hydraulic pressure at a given point in an aquifer. It's simply this level here, all right? <coughs> That's hydraulic head, it's the product, it's the, it's the, sorry, the sum of these two values. But you're never going to have to work out this or this value because essentially what you'll do is you'll be at a place on the Earth's surface, at a survey point of a known elevation, you'll drill the hole in the ground, you'll know how high above the ground your well is, you'll know how high below that point your water level sits, simply a matter of subtracting one from the other to get your hydraulic head to get this value of H, this level above sea level. That's one important thing about dealing with four holes, I've jumped forward a bit now, and piezometers and things. When you're constructing them, you always have to know how high above sea level you are. So you have to get the things to survey. You can't just guess from your topo map. You've got to get someone to come in and do it for you. You've also got to have a really good record, drawing, even if it's just a sketch, okay, of the construction of any of these holes, how deep they are, where they're screened, and all that kind of thing as well. Otherwise, all these values become meaningless because you have no idea what you're doing. And that's really important. That will come back into play later on as well. But essentially, it's the elevation of water will rise in a borehole connected to a point in an aquifer under pressure. Remember, I talked about piezometric surface and confined aquifers. Well, here's an aquitard, confined aquifer. You drill the hole into it. At this point, right, the water level will rise up here to 600 metres above sea level. Okay, so that's the piezometric surface. Okay. If we put this down here, it may actually rise up higher. But generally, in a well, what you do is you put a well into it and you screen the whole thing. So you're actually averaging the pressure. But either way, the water level in your well essentially is the hydraulic head. And it's a useful thing because it tells you if you've got more than one well, which hopefully you have, then it's going to tell you which way the groundwater is flowing in your area, okay? The direction of groundwater flow, which isn't always as easy as you think. You think, oh, it flows downhill, but it always flows downhill, unfortunately. So it provides indication of flow direction used to determine the gradient with the DH over the DL in Darcy's law. Simplify that in a minute and show you how we get it. Okay, there's the things you don't have to worry about that too much because this is before generally you know the elevation of the well head, you know the water level, so you can simply subtract one from the other to get your hydraulic head. You're not going to worry about calculating these things, so it doesn't really matter. All right, hydraulic gradient. Remember that all the things I've talked about, T and K, 
have been derived, or they're, 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 they're derived using a hydraulic gradient of one. And our hydraulic gradient of one is you go down one metre for every one metre horizontal, so going down essentially 45 degrees. That never happens, it's always way less than that. And you need to establish that value because, of course, I, or hydraulic gradient, the H over DL, is one of the integral parts of Darcy's law. Okay, and we get K, hydraulic conductivity, I, the gradient, and A, the area that of your aquifer that the water is flowing through. You have to establish this I somehow, this hydraulic gradient. It's really important. I said before, simply the change in heat, uh, distance between measuring points, and it equates to the slope of the water table at the metric surface. Okay, and once you establish that, establish that slope, you know which way the water is flowing. Okay, really, really useful information. You can start making some calculations, some basic calculations about your aquifer before you start stressing it too much. <coughs> it can be vertical, horizontal, or have components of each. Okay, the water can go up or down, it can go this way, it can go this way up. It doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't have to be going downhill. You'll see that um, in a later diagram. It's always, flow is always from high hydraulic, uh, high hydraulic head to low hydraulic head, so that's always from high H to low H. So if you've got high pressure deep down and lower pressure up here, you will all flow up. Okay, from the bottom up, you've got high here and low here, that will flow down towards the lower hydraulic here. There's two different um, situations. One where we've got horizontal hydraulic gradient, one we've got vertical hydraulic gradient. You put in some widely distributed piezometers, and they all into this aquifer here, and you see as you move from right to left, the water level changes, it goes down from right to left. Okay, and so here we have a higher hydraulic head, here we have a lower hydraulic head, and here we have a lower hydraulic head. We know the distance between these two points, we know the difference in water level, it's very easy to work out what the gradient is from that. Okay, in this case it's 0.1, the 200 metres apart, and the drop of level between them is 20 metres, so it's easy. Here we've got a series of nested piezometers, basically you've just got a tube and you've got different tubes within that tube going down to different levels, but they're all very close together, okay, sensing one next to the other. This one going down very deep, this one to medium depths, and this one to shallow depths. And you see, deep down, here, all right, this point way down here, the water level's higher, the hydraulic head's higher. Shallower, the hydraulic head's lower. So higher, higher head, lower heads. In this case, the water's going to flow upwards, okay? In this particular aquifer, the water's going upwards, not left or right. Okay. And again, you can work out the same way. Here's your DL distance between measuring points. Here's your DH distance between water levels. And simply one divided by the other. So we've got a hydraulic gradient here at 0.4. Okay? All good? I think so. Here's another representation of it. Moving water this way, and generally in the movement direction, or it has to be in the direction the water's moving, the pressure is going to the top. Okay, so it's high pressure here, lower pressure here. That doesn't matter. What? going on there. <coughs> Most of the heat decrease is due to conversion of the pressure heat to heat as the water flows through the aquifer. This changes a lot. Um, this will again will become really important when we start dealing with pumping wells and what happens in the vicinity of, um, of, uh, of well screens and things and also the, sh the shape of the water table when you start pumping a well, start dealing with um, gradients and, and, hydro and hydraulic heads in a much more sort of uh, practical manner. Uh, don't worry about that. Yeah. And so, you see, as I said before, the water table is analogous to the piezometric surface and vice versa. And it's all to do with hydraulic heat. Here you've got your unconfined aquifer, okay? The water comes up to this particular level, further down, okay? We've got a we're in our confined aquifer. So the water, in this case, is coming up to just, just above, so the artesian water flowing, artesian well. But essentially, the gradient going downhill there, even though it's going from unconfined to confined or whatever, that there is the hydraulic gradient, the water is flowing that way okay, in this system. Okay, if you have lots of info, and sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, sometimes you've got lots of piezometers spread around the countryside, and if you have, it's really useful because you can periodically measure all those, measure them all at the same time if you can, or within a very short time span of each other, and work out all those H values, those hydraulic heat values, and you can get a really good indication of what the groundwater is doing. Generally, the groundwater flow follows topography. Okay? If you're standing on the top of a hill, and you can see a valley down there, you can guarantee the water is going from the hill where it's below your feet down into the valley, especially if there's a stream there, okay? generally if you're in a drought. That's what's going to be happening. So it'll mirror the groundwater table generally at unconfined aquifers mirrors the topography. They're much more subdued 
uh, and I'm uh, representation of photography, but it will generally mirror topography. Okay? But to confirm these things, then you need to do something along the lines of here. Put three points here, A, B, and C. And we measured the calculated hydraulic heads at A, B, and C, and we've worked out that these are essentially like structure contours. If you've been doing structure contours back in the day, now it's exactly the same method of working out structure contours. And so we end up with equipotential lines. Okay, so these are lines of equal hydraulic head in okay, our aquifer. Okay, so you can see higher up here, lower, and okay, perpendicular to those equipotential lines, we can construct what we call flow lines, giving us the flow direction of the water. So from just about three piezometers, we already know which way our water is flowing in this area. You can duck this seasonally to see if the see if it changes, see if the water flow changes, because in like say droughts times. Different, uh, and when you drop into water tables down very, very low, streams of feeding aquifers, the hydraulic, the, 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 uh, hydraulic gradient can change when you raise the level and you're having aquifers feeding streams, it'll reverse itself. So that's really useful information and it's an important part of uh, groundwater studies. And you simply calculate the gradient using spacing, okay, you know, the spacing, the distance there, you know the difference in elevation, so you can calculate the gradient. From that quite easily. Okay, it's just like dealing with structure contours, except here we're treating the groundwater table as a bedding plane. Then there's the flow direction, and so if you draw lots of these arrows on here and they all intersect the equipotential lines at right angles, you end up with the grid and they become flow lines perpendicular to equal potential lines. You start building up what are called flow nets. Okay, you always put back down there you go. Four wells, you do the same sort of thing. The more information you have, the better, okay, the better you can make things. But essentially, as long as you know the positions of your piezos, your wells, and the water levels in them, the, the H's, then you can very easily start working up the groundwater regime of an area graphically and also calculate the um, hydraulic gradient. It's all good. See, it's starting to get much more complicated. There's a stream, you can see how the stream distorts the equipotential lines, okay, brings them back. Okay, and, and it does weird things, and the topography does the same sort of thing as well. But these are these are equal lines anywhere along here. There's an equal hydraulic head, so if you sunk a well anywhere there, the water level will rise up to the same level in any of those wells. And you see flow lines are drawn here. They flow. They're showing you what the paths of water takes as it encounters these different heads. And you see they're always drawn wherever it encounters a equal potential line. It's been 90 degrees, so the flow lines put all their way across the countryside, okay, because that's what the groundwater is doing. So it's not as simple as it always seems. It's not all just flowing in one nice direction. The water's taking different paths to get from different parts of the countryside to the other parts of the countryside. In this case, a stream and a well. And you can see here, here are the normal equipotential lines and flow lines, and the red ones are the ones to do with taking water out of the ground from that well. And we're going to talk about that later, because that's really important. That's, how, that's the whole purpose of these studies, to see what happens to the groundwater regime when you start stressing it. You can see it changes quite a lot when you start taking water out of the aquifer. The flow directions differ, the flow starts heading into the well, the potential lines change, head drops, all sorts of things change around the countryside. So that's really important information. <coughs> okay, we'll that stuff later. Okay, there you go. Here's how it all works. This is a very simplified land surface, hill. Valley with the stream in it, all there as well. We've got recharge here, it's a high point. We've discharged here because it's a stream, it's a low point, so the water is forced to flow from high to low. You can see these are equal potential lines here 150, 40, 30, 20, 10, 190 is essentially the same as topographic contours. Okay, but you can see how they change. Okay, they're not encountering a water table, of course, they're just flat. As soon as they have a water table, they start to distort. See as we get deeper, they distort more. But look at the important thing is the values of these things here 140, 130, 120. When the water goes from high head to low head, these are head values. Neutral lines in your along here is 140, 130, 120. Here the water's at 140, here it's at 130, so it's going to flow down towards that 130 value. Here it's at 120, so it's going to flow down towards it. Now remember they've got to intersect at right angles, so it starts the path of the water starts curving. Over here it intersects 110, 90, 190. It starts going up again, so you can see the potential here changing. I feel like here, higher here and lower here until you get to the stream where it's at lowest and the water discharges. Okay, so that's how this, these systems work. It always goes from high head to low head, right? But it doesn't always have to go downhill. Okay? Downhill, there you go. 
their output. So the flow lines always move down gradient, okay, high H to low H. You can see in the discharge and recharge areas, very steep, okay, steep gradients, right in the middle of the vertical, okay, here vertical as well. Gent more, much more gently sloping in the middle, okay, gently sloping the horizontal. And you get downward flow in the recharge area, okay, because the groundwater is a high heat, so the water is forced to go down and upward flow in the discharge area. Now, if you want to lower the water table, like in the drought, so this, this here comes down here somewhere, then the, the whole thing reverses and the water starts flowing from the streams into the aquifer, and you get a different set of heat future lines and flow lines. But being able to construct simple flow nets for the situation like this are really, really useful and really important. It's something that's done quite a lot in the real world, on computers now much more than by hand. Um, construction of dams, okay, or the existing dams to work out what's happening under a dam. You don't want water flying under a dam, if you do, you don't want it flying fast because it's pretty erosive. Okay, this is a situation where it's going from here to here reasonably rapidly. Okay? So people can some experiments, they put little barriers in here, and you can see much less water coming out here and a much slower rate, much more widely spaced equipotential lines and fewer flow lines. It's, it's, quite a, it's, it's done all sorts of things under buildings, all sorts of big structures, but an understanding of the groundwater system is really important when you're constructing things. We, most of the stuff we're going to be doing is simply talking about taking water out of the ground for people okay, to use um, you know, as potable water. But the whole study of hydrogeology is much, much greater than that. Okay? It's used, very useful for engineering constructions, all sorts of things like sort of mentioned earlier on in the piece. Okay, laminar, a little bit of laminar and turbulent flow. This becomes much more important when we talk about wells later on because generally moving through the ground where aqua water is going really slowly, so most of the flow will be laminar, you don't have to worry about turbulent flow at all. But it does become important when your water starts coming into well screens because the more of this you get, the more energy you lose and the more head loss you get, and the more drawdown you get, and the harder it is to pump water out of the ground. Darcy's law also only applies to this. This is much more complicated, okay, so we're not going to do too much about it. It's not and it's important to know about, uh, we're not going to get into the physics of it. <coughs> so, in the groundwater, as I say, generally very slow, so water molecules travel along smooth paths, nice, nice straight lines, okay, parallel to solid boundaries, and so you don't get much turbulence, okay, the flow is laminar, so you get something like this, okay, that just travels along parallel to the boundaries, good, okay, no problems at all. Problem is when things start to speed up a bit, large volumes of water are forced through constricted openings, okay, you start getting high velocities, unusual forces, lots of friction, and you start getting turbulent flow that starts behaving very erratically. You get lots of energy loss in the water. The faster something moves, the lower the pressure is, the more energy loss, the more turbulent it is. And the water molecules start travelling in irregular paths. Okay? It becomes really, really annoying. Okay? The energy is lost due to friction, okay? and you get these terms will become much more common to you later on, so you've done them yet, but you, you'll get head loss in your well, we get well inefficiencies, excessive drawdown, I think it comes when you start over pumping a well too quickly, trying to take too much water out, the aquifer can't supply enough, the velocities for the screens get really big, water level drops, the pump goes off or blows up, and everything turns very sad. <coughs> it's not a good thing. Okay, just a few examples of practical applications of this stuff before we run away. Darcy's law, here we go, Q equals K A. This is going to be replaced by I, because remember I is D H over D L, so Q equals K I A. So what you have to commit to me Q equals KIA, and just remember what KIA and Q are. Discharge equals hydraulic conductivity times <coughs> the gradient times area of the aquifer that the water is flowing through. Now we have to introduce this term here, this I, this DHDL, because remember, this one here is calculated with respect to a gradient of 1. The gradient limit is 1. So we have to calculate the gradient to multiply that by the hydraulic conductivity to get the real value. That's why that's yeah. Okay, so we've got this situation here for an aquifer, it's confined, got a couple of piezos in it, 1,000 metres apart, one has a hydraulic heat of 22, one of 20, aquifer has a K of 1 times 10 to minus 4 metres per second, and the flow is this way because we're going down gradients, so now it's coming out here, an average aquifer width of 200 metres and an average thickness of 10 metres. And we're going to calculate a couple of things, we're going to calculate the flow of the aquifer, so how much water is moving through it, and we want to calculate the volume of water that's stored per thousand metres to give us an idea of what the aquifer is containing, okay, so it's reasonably simple stuff. So we know what K is, we know what I is, okay, 22 minus 20 divided by the distance between them, so that's pH 
DL. 0.002, so you can see how that's much less than the 1 okay, that's assumed when you have a K. Right? It's way, way less, it's almost flat. Area of 10 by 200, when we've averaged those, to give us 2,000 square metres that the aquifer is flowing through. Okay? The water, the water sorry, is flowing through as it comes out of any slice of the aquifer. So if you multiply all those together, you get a discharge of 34.4 cubic metres a day okay, flowing through. <coughs> Any particular slice of that aquifer, you've got 34 cubic metres a day, that 0.4 litres a second. So, not very much water flowing through, a very low gradient, okay, it's a smallish aquifer. So, that's our flow. And of course, calculate the volume of the, of the water stored is easy. All we need is the, um, the porosity of the aquifer, and we're going to use it also our uh, porosity of about 30% for a nice sand gravel aquifer, so about 30% open space containing water. Okay, so it's simply a matter of dividing by multiplying our area by our length, area by length, by our effective porosity, okay, the amount of water that the free aquifer will actually yield to get volume, so 600,000 cubic metres stored in any 1,000 metre section of the aquifer. So you can see that the flow is much less than the aquifer volume. Okay, you've got 600,000 cubic metres stored here, and you've got only a flow of 34 metres a day of that is moving okay, through any particular. Um, to the area of the aquifer at any one time. It's very useful to have this information, okay, because these values will give you a really good idea if it's a good aquifer to, to, to utilise, if it's a bad aquifer to utilise. If you want to utilise it anyway, how much you can pump it before you start doing damage to it, how much water you're likely to get out for the least cost, shallowest pump, shallowest well, etc. You can do other things as well. We've got this river flowing through, we're assuming that the river is entirely fed by the aquifer, and the flows, you know, the water comes down, seeps through the ground through various ways and, and ends up discharging the river, which then carries it away. We can calculate the that river flow as well under steady state conditions. Okay, so by steady state, nothing's changing, it's just constant, it's all good. We've got our holes here, drawn a couple of holes, so we can look at our gradient, we've got our distance between them, so 22, 20, 500 meters. This is unconfined, by the way, not a confined aquifer. <coughs> okay, we've got our um, thickness. Okay, we know how long the river section we're dealing with, etc, etc, etc. We've got all our parameters nailed down, so it's all good. We're assuming our aquifer is a nice sand gravel aquifer with a K of 5 times 10 to the minus 4. These, these K values are really high, actually, when you're dealing with aquifers. <coughs> Most of the time you have to 10 to minus 6 and things like that. So we know our K, we know our gradient, 22 minus 20 over 500. We know our, the area, so it's 20 metres on average, by 2,000 metres, we're doing over that 2,000 metre length. Alright, and so discharge into the river from the aquifer along this, this, this length here is about 40,000, uh, sorry, 40,000, 6,000 cubic metres a day. That's for one side of the valley, double that, and it gives us 13,000. So we can also we can start calculating other things when we have information as well. I don't how much water is flowing through the river in this case, assuming the river is entirely fed from the aquifer will actually flow through 2,000 metres of a river, of a, of a river system. So you can already start doing some useful practical things with a very small amount of information. Of course, to get this information to start with, you've already had to drill holes, you've already spent money, get things surveyed, um, measure elevations over periods of time, try and quantify your aquifer material.